Good afternoon. My name is Mateen Victor, and I'm joined by my partners Kevin Miri, Andre Damata, Ran Wang, and Ravi Singh. We're Group 8, and we will be presenting to you Arundel Partners, the SQL Project case. Now, we're going to begin with a case overview, followed by two valuation models we prepared for today, one being a DCF and the other a real options valuation model. We're then going to have a model challenge, comparing and contrasting the pros and cons of each approach, and we'll comment on why we think the options valuation model is the more effective vehicle to describe the essence of the case from an analytical perspective. We'll also talk about organizational and strategy challenges that could arise for Arundel implementing their vision and business idea. And finally, some ancillary finance considerations, uh, time permitting. So it's probably best to start with a description of setting. And the setting for this case is 1992 Los Angeles, which we know to be the global capital for filmmaking, design, and production work. And one movie industry analyst has been asked to evaluate a unique business idea involving the purchase of sequel rights from major US film studios. So the prospective acquirer, which is Arundel, looks to purchase sequel rights to a film studio's entire production schedule for a specified period before, before the initial installment of any film series has even been made. This is an options-based business model in the sense that Arundel waits to see if particular films, debut films, happen to become successful on their box office debut, and then can exercise the sequel rights on that film to either produce the sequel by itself or sell the sequel rights to the next highest bidder. Meanwhile, if the initial film flops in theaters and isn't successful whatsoever, uh, the option will simply expire unused. Now there's a critical element of timing here as well, which is the, the sequel rights had to be purchased before the studio even knew which films it would produce. This is to avoid information asymmetry. If the studio is producing the film, it will begin to get more and more intimately familiar with it, of course, and it can sort of ascertain whether it will be successful in theaters. This will allow them to charge a premium to Arundel for purchasing the sequel rights later in the process. So Arundel wanted to avoid that. That's why this happens at the preliminary stage, the acquisition of sequel rights. And talking about value, a critical element of the value creation mechanism here is relative comparative advantage in the sense that what one party to the transaction lacks, the other provides sort of synergistically creating value and offering what the other party is missing. Because movie making is an expensive and fundamentally risky business. It's very difficult to predict the likelihood of a success uh, rate for any given film, given the changing tastes of audiences and all sorts of extraneous factors. And studios themselves are not flush with cash whatsoever. It's, it's a risky business. They, they require heavy financing. And um, those financing constraints often place limits on the creative potential of firms due to monetary or other considerations. Meanwhile, oppositely, Arundel has a lot of cash on hand and they have significant investment capabilities. So by buying studios production rights, Arundel offers much needed cash and financial security for the studios, reducing their borrowing needs and allowing for greater creative potential. Now in exchange, Arundel receives and benefits from the expertise of the US's leading film studios, which have the creative vision, people, resources and expertise to create blockbuster films. I'm going to hand it over to Kevin now to talk about the analytical models we prepare for today. Thanks, Mateen. So starting off with our traditional MPV or DCF valuation, we wanted to outline our basic inputs first. So starting off with expected cash flows, we wanted to incorporate the unsystematic risk of the actual project into this metric. And in order to do so, we had to find a probability metric for the uh, probability of success of a sequel that we had to multiply the cash flows by. Basically, what we were trying to do here was divide out unsystematic and systematic risk into our cash flows and discount rates, respectively. Now, as we will see later on, we use two models to calculate the probability metric. This is primarily because um, we, we conducted a lot of sensitivity analysis and realized that the expected cash flow was an input that the NPV was very sensitive to and, is and it was, was therefore paramount to maximizing um, shareholder value in this case. So moving on to our project timeline, uh, we used the project timeline of four years. Uh, this is because the median sequel release time was three years after the first film's release, meaning sequel production had to be at time, uh, t equals three for release to be t equals four. Now with this, uh, with this information in mind and the project's horizon in mind, we use a US five-year treasury rate as our risk-free rate to actually match the horizon of the project. Uh, for our market risk premium for the discount rate, we then used 40 years worth of S&P 500 historical returns and subtracted that from uh, the U.S. Treasury rate returns for 40 years as well, giving us a market risk premium of 5.92%. Uh, 
And then our beta was just drawn from Damodaran's US sector data, primarily from the entertainment industry, because we believe that the entertainment industry um, encapsulate a lot of the systematic risks that come with the film industry. So with our basic inputs in mind, um, we're going to turn to our actual two models. So the first model assumes that we're going to use the first film success to predict the success of the second film. So in this case, we assumed a 20% IRR hurdle for the second film. We ran a regression between the IRR of the first film and the IRR of the second film. We realized that they were very statistically significant with a coefficient of 0 0.5. So if we assume an IRR hurdle rate of 20% for the second film, that means the first film would have to hit an IRR of 40%. And that was basically our filter that we used. We realized that 37 of the 99 movies had first films that, that had IRRs over 40%. And that gave us a probability of success for the sequel of 37.37%. Now our average cash flows were just the averages of those 37 films, giving us our expected cash flow. Uh, we discounted these values and we assumed that to purchase the sequel rights was 2.5 million per film, providing us with an NPV of 1.90 million. Now, model two was very similar methodology, except for that when it came to the probability metric, we instead assumed that the probability of success of the sequel would be based on the hypothetical values of the sequel itself. So basically, we looked for sequels that had hypothetical net cash inflows that were positive. Uh, to make sure that the comparison was equivalent, we first discounted our cash, out, uh, our cash inflows to T equals three so that the cash outflow and the cash inflow were being compared at the similar time because the cash outflow was a year before the cash inflow. Now, you doing that, we found that only 26 firms had positive uh, net cash inflows um, out of the 99, providing us with a probability of 26.26%. And then the rest of the methodology was the exact same. So to, uh, to, to further our understanding of the MPV, we then conducted a Monte Carlo simulation on both models. So model one, we sensitized, we actually sensitized the same three inputs for both models. And we realized that average cash flow was the one input that both models were most sensitive to by far uh, when it comes to uh, probability and cost of capital, it wasn't even close. So we sensitized average cash flow, uh, probability of successful sequel, and our discount rate. Uh, for the average cash flow, we used a normal distribution. Uh, we had a standard deviation, we wanted a, a, a nice bell curve. Um, to get a nice range of different uh, simulated outcomes. A PERT distribution was used for the probability because we wanted an upper and a lower bound. And a triangular distribution was used for the discount rate because we weren't sure what type of distribution a discount rate would take on, but we did have an idea of a maximum, which is typically where you would use a triangular distribution. So based on model one, we can see that the NPV ranges quite a bit. It, it ranges from negative 8 million to 13.9 million per film. And this is all... Um, a testament to the fact that it, the DCF does not account for the sheer volatility in the average cash flows, which is why we have such a broad range. Uh, when we look to model two, the same, the same case is here. Uh, again, average cash flow is by far the most uh, sensitive uh, thing that the output is sensitive to in terms of inputs. And so when we look to this big flaw of DCF um, through the fact that it doesn't take into consider the volatility of the expected cash flows, this is when options valuation becomes a, um, a, a, a key area of uh, interest, which is something that I will pass on to Rand to speak about to you all. We were also tasked to assess whether the average $2 million per sequel rate is a good investment using an alternative to the DCF. Arendelle's business model is buying sequel rights to original movies before they're even released. The reason is that studios only produce sequels if the originals are successful. So if the studios were to buy the sequel rights before the originals are even released, then they could buy them for cheap. So essentially, Arendelle's business model is betting on that some of the original movies will be hits. We can use the Black Scholes option pricing model because this arrangement is similar to a call option that grants the holder the option to buy the asset. Of course, the holders will only exercise the option if the current stock market price is higher than the exercise price so that they can sell them on the market for profit. Parallel to Arendelle's case, it will only produce the sequels if the original movie is successful. Why should we use Black Scholes in addition to DCF? 
because only black shows accounts for management flexibility. In this case, if the original is not successful, then Arendelle's management has the flexibility to not produce a sequel to cut further their negative cash flows. But DCF doesn't have this feature. Also, Black Shows uses the volatility of similar projects. In our case, we use the standard deviations of returns of expected sequels produced in 1989 by six major studios. However, the discount rate used in DCFs uses the firm's equity beta, which might not appropriately reflect the risk profile of the project. Now, let's take a look at how to use the Black Scholes model. It has five inputs. The first is the stock price. Sequel rate is not an equity stock, so we use the average expected cash inflows of the sequels produced. The second is the exercise or the strike price. Arendelle would not exercise its option unless the hypothetical cash flows of the sequel exceeded its expected cost. So we use this figure. The third is the time to maturity. We use the one year for this because we'll know whether the original movie is successful or not after only four or five years. The fourth is the annual risk-free rate, which is just the 8.26 treasury rate that we used in our DCF earlier for consistency. The last is the annual volatility. We use the standard deviation of returns of expected sequels produced in 1989 by six major studios given in the case. After we determine the inputs, we use the Black Scholes formula to calculate the option value. We also use a Monte Carlo simulation to consider the ranges of the five inputs. The median result of running the simulation is 9.92 million, which is greater than the 2 million average sequel write price. So it's a good investment. Great, and now we'll be presenting our answers to question four and question five. Question four asks us to determine whether the real option valuation or the DCF option of the DCF valuation were superior to one another. And ultimately we thought that uh, Arundel should use both as they complement one another in terms of the getting to the true value of the business opportunity that Arundel has. And in coming to this conclusion, uh, we went through the pros and cons of the DCF valuation as compared to the real options valuation and only uh, included those that we thought were most important considerations and ranked uh, them in, in order of importance. So for the DCF, we thought the major upside to our model was the fact that it could account for the assumptions of the business opportunity that Arundel specifically had. And, and that what we mean by that is the fact that Arundel would not exercise the option to create a SQL if um, there was a negative NPV associated with any SQL. And so we accounted for that by multiplying the probability of a successful SQL being created by the cash flows we expected from the sequels. And also we thought as a communication tool, it was more favorable than the real options. Um, however, a downfall of the DCF valuation was that it didn't really account for the appropriate risk of the opportunity that um, Arundel had. And we assume we say that because we use CAPM to discount and CAPM assumes that the investor holds a diversified portfolio of assets. And here it's unlikely that they would hold a diversified portfolio of, of movies. Uh, given that they only invest in one or, or fewer uh, studios rather than the market as a whole. And also the DCF Im imported some very specific uh, data assumptions that uh, we thought could not be tenable, might not be tenable in the future, that being the number of sequels we use. So we thought, you know, 26 is probably unrealistic uh, number of sequels for them to produce or run to produce in a given year, given that they won't contract with likely all of them, like not all the studios will contract with them. And, um, and some of the, the uh, movies that they have contracts to or options to, to exercise likely just wouldn't be exercisable uh, given that they either are negative, gonna be negative NPV or they're just not sequelizable. It made, they can be made into sequels. Uh, on the real option side, we thought the biggest plus was the fact that it accounts for volatility. As we've demonstrated or we discussed, sorry, uh, there's a lot of volatility that goes into uh, their expected returns of these specific sequels. And so that's something that DCF didn't catch and that the real option valuation did catch, we thought was very important. And also fundamentally, we thought the real options in terms of on the ground floor and the three different phases that Arundel will be going through, it'll be a lot easier to implement those specific suggestions um, on the ground floor. And so 
for those reasons, uh, we thought that the real options valuation was superior to the DCF, but that both should be used in, in coming to the fair valuation of Arundel. And so for question five, you're asked to look at the organizational and the strategic challenges or business challenges that um, would confront or Arundel would have to confront to make this uh, a successful operation for them or investment. And the, on the organizational challenges we have there, again, ranked in order of what we thought were most important is negotiating the contractual terms with the studios they contract with, finding studios that are even willing to produce the sequels, and trying to actually go out and convince market leading studios to contract with them. And we thought, we thought these were like the most important and ranked in priority, uh, given that depending on what the contractual terms are with the studio, it, this could be successful or not successful. If the studio who's producing the original contract or the original movie isn't willing to produce the sequels then the quality of the sequel might not be there, um, as well as them having known the, you know, or being most intimately aware of the different um, plots and themes of specific movies, not having the original studio would be detrimental to uh, a rental's investment opportunity. And then on the strategic and business challenges that Arundel faces, we thought of them the most important would be the option pricing and coming to, you know, a, a good negotiation strategy for us is we know that they're willing to pay around 2 million or sell their option, their rights for 2 million, but we know the fair value of that is more. So it's trying to figure out, you know, how can we negotiate to have that uh, option pricing more favorable for us or for Arundel? Um, the ability to purchase sequel rights of all movies, because we know that if the studio is able to retain the sequel rights for some movies, they'd likely pick the movies that will be the most likely to be made into sequels. And so we'd be, our option would be significantly less valuable. And we also think the business strength and durability of a studio is very important because if they're going to go under and they can't even produce a given movie to, for, that we could have a right to create the sequel from, then it would be, uh, there'd be no value for us to capture. And so given these different challenges, we thought the two most important recommendations we can make for Arundel to increase their expected value of this investment is to include in the option contracts an incentive to motivate studios to produce movies that will lead to sequels. And that could be either revenue ties to the potential sequel that won't be too detrimental to our future expected value, but that will motivate them to produce more movies that could be sequelizable. And our second recommendation would be to contract with studios that have no apparent business or operational issues, because the last thing we'd want to do is to um, in contract with a company that's gonna go under, that laborers are gonna go on strike or any other issues that would prevent us from getting any value from these rights. And now I'll pass it over to uh, Kevin. So to end up, we just wanted to point out some ancillary finance considerations that might add accuracy to our valuation models. Uh, the first one is to actually find the expected value of the selling of selling the SQL rights. There wasn't much information in the case, so we had to assume that it was zero for our model, but obviously, as was stated, Arendel does have the opportunity to sell it. So instead of a, an MPV of zero for that scenario, it might be an actual positive MPV. Uh, two, we believe that the sample of the films provided was inappropriate in a sense because it was rather arbitrary. It's, it, it was akin to um, trying to value a firm in an industry by picking a random number of firms from that industry instead of looking at the characteristics of the actual comps. And then finally, kind of um, to that second point, using a studio-specific valuation might be in the favor of Arendelle unless they are looking to invest in enough studios where they're div diversifying out the unsystematic risk associated with the studio, which didn't seem to be the case. Um, but given more information about what type of studios they wanted to invest in, the valuation would be able to be more accurate and more uh, akin to the characteristics of the film they're actually looking for. So thank you so much for your time and we hope you uh, learned something.